So the program started in 2012, uh, but the decision to launch the program started in the Army about a year before that. Uh, so when, they, uh, when the Army was look, thinking about this problem, which is how do you design protection materials, they decided they needed to create a program to look at materials for extreme dynamic environments. And uh, as a consequence, the Center for Materials and Extreme Dynamic Environments was set up here at Hopkins in 2012, April 2012. The impetus was the um, realization that we needed uh, better armor materials. We had gone through a time when we were using uh, computational methods to design materials and armors together. And there were some areas we did very, very well, and there were some areas that were really lacking. And we saw the gap and we realized that we have to have a better understanding of how materials deform and perform in order to make better materials. The Mead program doesn't make armor. The Mead program thinks about the materials that comprise armor and how we can improve on those materials. And one major improvement we can make is to come up with lighter weight materials, and that was one of the primary goals of Mead, was to identify lighter weight materials that would perform similarly under impact. The goal of the program was to look at the materials or different material classes at uh, different scales, um, you know, starting from atomistic scale to the application scale, which is, you know, could be a meter scale. So that required um, expertise at uh, all these different length scales. There was an opportunity to do uh, materials by design. There were emerging tools that allowed us to see deeper into materials, that allowed us to develop better understanding of how they deform and break, and that those were leading to a renaissance in theory and that was coming together with computations at the time that were getting uh, more and more massively scalable. Traditional material science is siloed into modeling efforts, testing, and processing and synthesis of materials. Uh, materials by design has to pull all three of those together. And so you're bringing together a community of people who have traditionally spoken a different language and their view of materials has been completely different and we've got them speaking the same language and working together towards a common purpose. Traditionally, what we did was one person or one group would make a material. Three years later, somebody would take it and test it. Three years after that, somebody would start building a model for it. And by the time you built the model and you knew what was going on, the person who's making that material isn't making that anymore. They're making something else. And so you couldn't integrate all of this into one loop. What we did was bring all those loops, to, all those people together. They were talking to each other, talking about the same thing. We've organized ourselves around three different materials classes that we're studying. So one is in metals, one is in ceramics, and one is in composites. And each of those groups work very closely together, meeting on a regular basis, um, and working towards common metrics that they all have decided are key to the performance of that material. Here we're designing materials that don't exist, and it gave us the opportunity to synthesize and create materials for the first time. So that was very exciting. As these materials fail, they exhibit a number of what we call mechanisms. And a mechanism is a way in which the material absorbs the energy coming in. So it might crack, it might yield, it might fracture. What we've done in this program is set up a mechanism-based design approach where we identify those mechanisms and we design the material to um, improve those mechanisms. If you look at the candidate material we chose, we took a material called boron carbide. And early on, we had known, right when the mead began, that there was a phenomenon called amorphization. What we wanted to do is, could we change that? When we, one of the solutions we found was by changing the chemistry of the crystal itself. If we look at what the standard material was 10 years ago, that material was about 22% heavier. We took that candidate material, which was lighter, but was not performing, and made it perform better. Uh, when I look at uh, the history, you know, we've uh, been looking at uh, you know, creating a computational framework for materials design of our model uh, S-Glass composite uh, system. So early on, we set uh, some you know, you know, early objectives of you know, targeting uh, you know, a certain level of energy absorption, knowing that 
increased energy absorption would lead to you know, greater ballistic performance. And we created two objective functions, one for a penetrating armor case and one as a, 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 a thick section composite used as a backing plate for a strike face material such as a ceramic. So one of the driving forces on vehicles is trying to get lighter weight metals that can give you the same protection as the steels, which we know work. Magnesium is only slightly heavier than most polymers and composites. And so our hope in, in choosing magnesium as a model material was really to say, let's look at the lightest weight structural material we can get and ask, can we strengthen this enough so that it can operate as a protection material for vehicles? In the case of magnesium, there were two mechanisms that are active. Um, one is called dislocations, the other is called twinning. But this is something we learned going through the process. And we learned that we could control them almost independently. And so using this, these approaches, we've been able to come up with microstructures that give us performance improvements of about 15% in using each approach. It was intense collaboration. It was not just, you know, myself and a couple of my colleagues in the lab. It was wide, you know, collaboration. And that has begun to, you know, occur in the lab, where people are going way behind their, you know, domain of influence to work with other people, tap into other people's skill sets, and all come together to solve a problem. You know, MIDI was big in that. You know, the modelers, the experimentalists, um, we, we were in constant contact, constant contact. As the Mead evolved in that first year, we were in many cases thrown into the pool together where we had to work together and we had to learn better ways of communicating. By the end of the program, this became something that is unique in anything I've ever done in my life and we're able to address problems very rapidly because of those close collaborations. So when we started the program, what I was excited about are what were the tools that I would have to fill the gaps that slowed me down. Okay, if I was designing armor, I understood that there were things that I couldn't calculate my way through fast enough and we had to go, we had to go shoot and look. Not only do I have better tools now, not only have better materials, but I've got a much more agile workforce to contribute to the rapid development of those technologies. Workforce development is always a focus of uh, Army Research Laboratory on Army. Um, we need people who will solve the future problems uh, of the Army, you know, the problem set is changing continuously. So we need smart people and uh, smart people who are knowledgeable about the tools and tackles we need to solve the Army problem. And uh, spring 2020, I was awarded the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship, and I'm truly honored to have received that. And I think that a lot of uh, my experiences that I've gained uh, during this program really impacted both the quality and success of my application. This program has generated hundreds and hundreds of journal articles, um, thousands of citations, 65 or so PhD dissertations have been defended, another 30 summer in the works, so there's 100 PhD students um, getting produced by the Mead program. So all of that adds up to an enormous impact on the material science community. I worked on projects, complex projects before, but the Mead was different. You know, they, the problem was complex, but you have uh, a wide variety of experts in the field you are working with. So it was just exciting. The collaboration that we had, I was able to, in this program, work with people who are not just best in the United States, they're the best in the world at what they do. So this whole process of building it out, bringing it together for me is really an example of how you can take basic science, 
translate it to an application, and then get to the point of building something that somebody can use. I think we all take the responsibility very seriously that what we're doing is intended to save soldiers' lives. I think by improving these armor materials, uh, we have real impact on keeping people safe, and I think that has motivated much of our research. We're going into a world where the speed of competition is really what's going to win or not win a fight. And we need to be able to change and we need to be agile. And because our scientists and engineers are smarter, they're going to be more agile, they'll be able to innovate faster.